Hello and welcome back. In the previous section, we had a hands-on demo of how to run an LLM, which is Llama 2, on Vulture GPU stack. So this section will give you a thorough background and explains what goes behind the scenes of an LLM. And this is going to be the foundation for rest of the topics that we are going to dive deep in the upcoming videos. So I'll start with an overview of LLMs with some examples, followed by the key characteristics that define the large language model. We'll also get a chance to look under the hood of LLMs, uh, what are the building blocks and uh, especially what are the transformer models. And finally, I will touch upon techniques for building modern applications powered by LLMs. How do we consume LLMs, uh, specifically the open source and the non-commercial models available on Hugging Face. So let's get started. So large language models are cutting edge neural networks engineered to comprehend and generate human-like text. When you provide a prompt, they respond almost like a human that you are interacting with. So this is possible because the models such as GPT-4 and Llama 2 boast enormous parameter counts. Now, if you remember, we touched upon the parameters during the hands-on demo. So the parameters enable the large language model with various capabilities. And sometimes these LNMs acquire remarkable language understanding capabilities that are comparable to human understanding and human ability to respond to queries. They're constructed on a transformer architecture employing attention mechanisms for context processing. Now, what this really means is instead of responding like machines that lack the context, these LLMs understand the meaning and the context of the text that you are providing both as an input and the responses that these models generate as response. So the most important thing to understand is the contextual understanding or the contextual ability of the LLMs to both comprehend what is coming as a prompt, as an input to the model, and how to construct the response that goes back uh, to the user or to the application that is interacting with the LLM. So LLMs go through two main phases, which makes them quite capable. The first one is the pre-training, uh, where they are trained on vast text corpora. And uh, uh, the second phase is about fine tuning for specific tasks. For example, when you look at Llama 2, it has three specific flavors or um, three specific variants. The first one is the Llama 2 model, which is meant for word completion. Now, the second flavor is more like a chatbot. So when you're developing a chatbot, you will essentially use the chat variant of Llama 2. More recently, Meta has also launched what is called as the Code Llama. So Code Llama is capable of generating code uh, when, you, when you prompt the LLM with a natural language query. While the base model remains the same, the fine tuning is what makes the difference. So fine tuning will take an existing model and adopts it to a specific scenario or a specific task. For example, if the base model is Llama 2, the chat model is a, a fine tuned model based on uh, techniques like the reinforcement learning with human feedback uh, or supervised fine tuning to interact with the applications or the end users like a typical conversation. Now, similarly, 
the same base model of LAMA2 that is pre-trained on large corpora of both text and code is further fine-tuned to respond with code-specific capabilities. So, that is a fundamental difference between pre-training and fine-tuning. Of course, once the model becomes available, we can fine-tune this further to a specific domain. For example, the large language model may not understand the nomenclature or the conventions used in a specific domain like healthcare or finance or, uh, or bioengineering, uh, for example. So we can take the base foundation model, create a custom data set that contains the nomenclature and the lexical inputs that the LLM should be capable enough to respond with. And then we fine tune the base model to acquire the understanding of the domain or the vertical that we are training based on the data set. We'll actually take a look at fine tuning in the upcoming uh, videos in the series. But even before the model is made available, the model provider does basic fine tuning to make sure it can uh, it can become available in the chat flavor, for example, or in the code flavor in the case of Llama two. So while they excel in uh, natural language tasks, you know, like translation, code generation, sentiment analysis, there are multiple challenges. For example, one of the challenges is ethics. The other one is bias mitigation. And the third one is model interpretability. So the challenge with large language model is the guardrails that need to be applied to the LLM uh, when it is responding to sensitive issues. Because these models are trained on the publicly available data sets and the publicly available uh, content, they are prone to have the same concern of the um, ethical responses and biases that we, we might typically see in the user-generated content available on the web. So it's very important for developers to apply guardrails to make sure that the LLMs are responding, keeping the ethics and the bias mitigation in mind. Similarly, the other challenge is the opaqueness or the lack of model interpretability. Now, it's extremely difficult to understand why an LLM has responded in a certain way. And for that matter, it's also very difficult to understand how LLMs actually learn. So, one of the big challenges that we have with LLMs is both understanding how they get trained, how they acquire this capability of contextual understanding and the attention mechanism, and also at runtime when we are performing inference, what made them respond in a, in a specific form. And it's also hard many times to go back to the source that has contributed to the uh, response coming back from the LLM. So this opaqueness and lack of interpretability makes LLMs quite a bit of a challenge for developers to work with. As we go along, we'll actually see some techniques to avoid the bias and also bring in some kind of interpretability and apply guardrails to make sure the out outcome or the response of these LLMs is predictable and uh, it doesn't hallucinate uh, and it, it comes back with fairly accurate answers as much as possible. A large language model or LLM is a deep learning algorithm that is capable of a range of natural language processing or NLP tasks, uh, such as text generation, classification, conversational question and answers, and text translation. So, NLMs or large language models are called large because they are trained on massive data sets, massive data sets of text and code. There may be trillions of words in these data sets and the data sets quality will certainly have an impact on how well 
the LLM performs. So the larger the data set, the quality of the data set will definitely going to have an impact on the quality of the LLM. The number of parameters that LLMs have is also considerable. For example, in the demo, we have seen Llama 2 and it comes with uh, three different flavors based on the parameter size. There is one with 7 billion parameters, the other one with 13 billion parameters and the largest contains 70 billion parameters. Now, obviously, the model with the largest number of parameters is more compute intensive. The model with the largest parameter is definitely more compute intensive and requires more GPUs, more memory and uh, uh, more CPUs to perform uh, at, a, at a reasonable, acceptable latency. The smaller parameterized models can be launched even on low-end compute environments, including uh, desktop computers or even uh, cloud instances with a single GPU. For example, we were able to run a 7 million parameter on uh, a fraction of A100 GPU or even uh, on a consumer desktop environment powered by an NVIDIA GeForce RTX 4090. As long as you have at least uh, 16 to 24 GB of memory, you'll be able to run the 7 billion parameter model. So this is directly proportional to the resource requirements. Now, the parameters can be thought of as units of memory that the model learns during training. You can think of these parameters as the knowledge base of the model. The larger the, data, the, the training data set, the larger the size of parameters. Because LLMs can potentially have billions or even trillions of parameters, they obviously demand a lot of computing power to train and run. So one of the biggest decision point for you is to choose a model that fits your resource requirements and, and the resource constraints you may have. So obviously uh, it's, it's very uh, practical to choose a model that comes with a reasonable set of parameters and uh, they can fit into the available GPU memory that your machine or the cloud instance uh, has. So once an LLM is trained, it basically accepts a prompt in the form of an input and then responds with a task. And, and this task could be like a word completion. So you, you send a sentence that has a blank to the trained LLM and it comes back with the complete phrase or the sentence. Uh, now that is the word completion uh, LLM task. Similarly, you can have some context and then you can uh, have the LLM behave like a chatbot and, and the task there is chat completion. LLMs can also translate. Depending on how many languages they are trained on, you can perform, for example, translating English to French or French to German and so on. Because they are trained on large data sets and they understand how a typical sentence is formed and what could be the correct pattern, LLMs can also be used for rephrasing the content. So you send a, a text and you can ask uh, an LLM to increase the fluency or the vocabulary of the sentence and the LLM can do it. That's because it knows what are the typical words or the patterns used to articulate a sentence that has the same meaning but with additional fluency, fluency or maybe additional vocabulary. So uh, these are some of the tasks that uh, an LLM is capable of. Now there are many LLMs available in the market. So if you are a developer, you can take a look at GPT, Palm, Claude, Llama, uh, Falcon from one of the uh, 
universities in uh, UAE, uh, NPT, and even a model from NVIDIA called Megatron. So what is the fundamental difference between these models? Well, uh, some of these models are proprietary and they're available only through an API. Other models such as Llama and Falcon are open and they can be deployed in a cloud environment or a data center of your choice. So we'll explore deploying some of these open models on the Vulture GPU stack, like the one that we have seen in the previous demo. So the commercial models that are available in the market, for example, GPT-4, Palm, Claude, they are exposed as APIs. So having seen what the LLMs are capable of, let's take a look at the key characteristics that differentiate LLMs from rest of the foundation models. So LLMs are large. That's why they're called large language models. They're based on enormous neural networks, typically composed of hundreds of millions to billions of parameters. As we discussed, parameters directly translate to the memory units that make the LLM capable of bringing the context and connecting the meaning of the words that they see in a sentence or a phrase. Their immense size allows them to store and manipulate vast amounts of information, making them highly expressive. LLMs are pre-trained, as we have seen earlier, on extensive data sets containing text from the internet. During pre-training, they learn to predict the next word in a sentence, acquiring a broad understanding of the language and the knowledge of the words and the language itself. After pre-training, as we discussed, they can be fine-tuned for specific tasks, making them extremely versatile and adoptable. So, NLMs are built on the transformer architecture, which excels at handling sequential data. The transformer architecture employs self-attention mechanism that allows the model to weigh the importance of different, different words in a sentence, uh, which is responsible for capturing complex relationship uh, and the dependencies that each of the word may have with the rest of the words in a sentence. So NLMs also possess a strong contextual understanding of language. They consider the context of a word or phrase when generating the text, allowing them to produce coherent and contextually relevant responses. This ability to grasp con concept is a, a key factor in their impressive language generation capabilities. And that's what makes LLMs address a wide range of NLP tasks, such as uh, translation, text summarization, sentiment analysis, and question answering. Their adaptability and strong language understanding makes them extremely valuable across a variety of domains and applications. The LNMs are based on complex neural network architectures that are tough to comprehend and understand. But to appreciate the capabilities of these models, we have to explore how they are designed. So the goal is to introduce you to the key concepts while not delving too deep, which might eventually confuse your understanding uh, because of the complexity involved in LLMs. But I want to focus on the core building blocks that will give you just enough knowledge and understanding and a mechanism to visualize how these complex neural network architectures are, are, are working together to help us generate these meaningful contextual responses from the models. So there are three essential building blocks involved in LLMs. The first one is tokens. The second is vector. Third are the embeddings. So tokens are the fundamental units into which the text is divided. Sometimes these Tokens may be directly mapped to a specific word or sometimes it is just a subset of the word. For example, when we look at this sentence called I love ice cream, it's easy for, for us to understand 
when we map each of these words to a specific token. Tokens are essentially how LLMs understand the input and produce the output. Because machines can only deal with numbers and not text, tokenization is an important technique of converting the text to numbers that the models can understand. So every prompt that you send to an LLM is initially tokenized and then get passed on to the LLM. Similarly, the LLM is going to only generate a set of uh, tokens and these tokens get mapped to individual words just before the response is sent. So, as you can see, the tokens are very important for the LLM, both at the input level and also at the output level. And then comes the vectors. So, vectors are the mathematical representations of text in a multidimensional space. And in LLMs, vectors are often used to represent words, phrases, sentence, or, or sometimes even the entire document. And vectors is how we typically store the tokens. So when we pass the text through what we call as the embeddings model, uh, we get back a set of tokens. And these tokens are stored as vectors which map the actual meaning of the word into a context. Now we'll take a closer look at that as we go along. But it's important to understand the concepts of tokens, vectors, and embeddings. So embeddings are essentially machine learning models that are capable of accepting text and generating vectors that actually map the internal meaning of a specific word to remaining words in that text or in that sentence. So you can think of the embeddings model as a machine learning technique to put the word into the context of a, a sentence or a phrase that is very relevant uh, to that interaction. So. Some of the popular techniques used to convert text to embeddings are uh, using the models like Glove, word to vec and FastText. Particularly when it comes to LLMs, the transformer-based architecture, uh, for example, BERT or GPT, provide embeddings model where they map each word or token to a dense vector representation in a way that it encodes the semantic and contextual information. For example, when you take a word like cat and pass it on to the embeddings model, you might get a large vector. And this vector places the word in the larger context of, let's say, maybe the entire vocabulary or the dictionary of English language. And, and this helps us find or place similar words or similar text close to each other. So this is the uh, an embedding representation, a hypothetical embedding representation of the word cat. So it represents an entity. It could be uh, a specific place, thing, or a noun, or a verb, or something from the English language. And then it also addresses questions like, is this an animal? And also, it takes off the ambiguity and uh, uh, represents the exact semantic meaning of the words on the text units that we pass. This means words that have similar meaning will be closer to their vector representations. For example, going back, when you pass a piece of text to the embeddings model and it generates vectors, and when you store all these vectors and perform what is called as a similarity search or a semantic search, it's easy to retrieve text or words that have similar meaning. For example, in the spatial representation, the cat word embedding might be placed close to the word embedding representing kitten. Similarly, the dog, pet, while other embeddings like king, queen, palace are closely related and they are kept uh, in a special context that is close to each other. 
So, text embeddings basically map a word or a or a uh, token to the semantic representation it actually represents. So, embeddings are used to convert uh, tokens into vectors, and this allows computers to process and understand textual data. Now, this is very essential for the uh, for the natural language processing models and LLMs to function. So, at their core, LLMs are neural networks with an intricate architecture called the transformer architecture. The transformer architecture is designed to handle sequential data, making it uh, ideal for tasks involving language. So, this has nothing to do with the electrical transformers, uh, but it is called transformer because it fundamentally transforms the input into something more meaningful. So, uh, this is only for representational purpose. Uh, don't get confused between the electrical transformer that we are familiar with, uh, with the neural network architecture called the transformers. So, the transformer architecture essentially consists of multiple layers with uh, two main components, the self-attention mechanism and feed-forward neural networks. As I mentioned earlier, they are actually called transformers because they are very good at transforming one sequence of data into another. So, self-attention mechanism will understand the importance or the attention it pays to uh, the meaning and the context of the world. So, it can basically figure out what exactly is the semantic meaning of the word instead of the literal meaning. And it also employs some of the proven techniques of neural networks like the uh, feed-forward uh, neural networks which provide a mechanism to generate the next token that is expected from uh, the neural network. So, Imagine you are working with a sequence of uh, text like sentences or uh, a series. A transforming model is a super smart machine that's really good at understanding and working with these sequences. Uh, a transformer model is not just meant to deal with text. It can deal with anything that is sequential, including time series, including um, the uh, understanding and uh, working with anything that has some kind of a sequential pattern. So, the secret sauce of transformers is what is called as attention. Now, think of it as the model's ability to focus on different parts of input sequence. For example, when translating uh, a sentence from English to French, it pays more attention to the relevant words in English while generating each word in uh, in, in uh, French. So, in the transformer architecture, self-attention is the key feature. It allows the model to weigh the importance of each word based on the context of the entire sentence. Uh, for example, it knows the meaning of bank in the context of a river bank and the bank account. So, when you ask the LLM to generate text, uh, or, or respond to a conversation that has the financial institution, the uh, finance-related, money-related context, and you use the word bank, it precisely knows that you're actually talking about money, finance, and the bank is an institution and not necessarily a river bank. But when you're talking about water, nature, and bank, it can associate the, the same word bank with the context of the river bank depending on the surrounding words and the semantic meaning of the word uh, in that specific context. So, that is what the transformer model is really good at. So, the transformer models are trained on massive data sets where they can, where they learn a lot about the language uh, and the world knowledge then they can be fine-tuned, as we have seen, for specific tasks like translation, sentiment analysis, or even conversational chatbots. You might have heard of uh, models like BERT, uh, GPT-4, Claude, 
Lama, uh, which are specifically meant for conversational uh, AI and conversational uh, uh, interaction, like a chatbot. Now, these are specific architectures based on transformer models uh, that have broken the records in various NLP tasks. So, this was a quick walkthrough of the building blocks and the architecture that goes behind the scenes of the LLM. So to summarize, the building blocks of an LLM are basically the tokens, vectors, and embeddings, and the core architecture that connects all the dots together and delivers an impressive response is the transformer neural network architecture. So those two are responsible for delivering the LLM capabilities. So in the next section of this series, we are going to get hands-on. We'll actually develop our first chatbot based on Meta's Llama 2 running on the Vulture GPU stack. Stay tuned and if you haven't subscribed to my channel, please do subscribe and click on the bell icon to get notifications when I upload new videos. NLMs are fast becoming an integral part of modern applications. They enhance the user experience by bringing natural language understanding into the interface. So chatbots are becoming a standard mechanism for end users to interact with applications. They find it far more convenient to directly ask a question and get the response instead of uh, uh, clicking multiple links or going through multiple searches and getting the contextual data that they may be interested in. So we are going to build applications that are powered by LLMs. But before that, I would love to give you some context on how to actually do that. What are the models available and how do you go about infusing generative AI into your applications? So developers can take advantage of LLMs by using the APIs that are made available by commercial providers like OpenAI or Cohere, uh, these platforms expose models such as GPT-4 from OpenAI or Command from Cohere as APIs. So just like the way you build applications uh, that are available as platform as a service or software as a service, you sign up with these model providers, you grab the API key, and you start calling or invoking the API every time you want the LLM functionality. The other mechanism is to use open models with a licensing policy that allows commercial and research-based use. These models are typically available on Hugging Face, as we have seen earlier, and uh, they can be very quickly hosted in your cloud or data center environments. This course focuses on open models that you can host on the Vulture GPU stack, and, and that those models stay very close to the applications and the data that you might be running on the Vulture Cloud. So going forward, we'll see how to develop applications that are powered by LLMs. Now, irrespective of how you consume these LLMs, whether you are consuming the API uh, exposed by a commercial provider or you are hosting an API by yourself, the workflow on the structure of how you build an application powered by LLM remains the same. So to improve the accuracy of LLMs, developers must understand the fundamentals of prompt engineering and uh, a few techniques that are required to augment the prompt. So in the next section of this series, we'll explore prompt engineering and build our first LLM powered application based on open source model. Stay tuned and if you haven't subscribed to my channel, please do subscribe and like this video. I'll see you in the next video where we'll go about building an end-to-end -end application, a chatbot application running on Vulture GPU stack.